So if I didn't have this mask on, you could see this. I have this giant grin on my face. I'm like practically crying. It's amazing to see all of you here in this room. I think there were a few of you who were here in this room with me on what was that fateful day, March? 13th. March 13th. 13th. Yeah. Huh? We had our um, admitted students day, and we were having this nice little meeting in here, and everybody was freaking out. And after that, you know, we didn't come back for a year and a half. So anyway, it is just wonderful to see you all here. Colleagues I haven't seen in forever, former students who I have you back, and students I met last year and never met in person, and then meeting in person now, and all the new students. So, welcome. This is the ITS Friday, ITS Davis Friday afternoon seminar. We've got a wonderful lineup for you. Um, and Marie sent this out, so you've got that somewhere, and I think it's posted on the web as well. We hope you will all be here for these wonderful sessions. And I should note that, um, actually, I'm not in charge of the supporter. John Harvey is our faculty host. So he's the, he's the one who's been inviting most of these folks and will be standing up here uh, introducing um, A little business first. This is a class for a lot of you. We require the transportation students, both CTP and civil, I think, right, to take the seminar for two years. So it is CTP 281, and there are very minor requirements that go along with taking this course for your one unit of credit. And um, what we want you to do is be here in person if you can, and we recognize that these are unusual times, so you might not always be here, and there are ways to watch the seminar after the fact. And of course, we want you to be um, active participants and engaged in, um, in you know, what the presenter is presenting. And so to encourage that active engagement, your requirement for the course is to come up with three questions for the speaker that you do not have to ask the speaker but we want you to be thinking about the material and, and you know, what questions does this raise for you? And then you submit those questions via Canvas. So if you're enrolled in the class, you have access to the Canvas site and it's through quizzes, it's very easy to get in there and put your, your three questions in. And that's how you'll get credit for the course. You have to submit questions for seven of the eight seminars that we have over fall quarter and they should be submitted by, I think we said Tuesday at 5 p.m., mm -hmm. which is good. You don't want to get let it go too late. I mean, you can do it. You can do it while you're here. You can, you know, do it immediately after class. So just get that done. And then of course, you know, here's my little mom spiel. You know, be good attendees. We are inviting these people to be here. These are very busy, important people who could be doing lots of other things with their time, they are donating their time to be here to share their expertise with you. So please be on your best behavior here for our guests. Um, we used to say no devices. I mean, I think, uh, yeah, try and avoid being on your phone or your laptop if you can. I'm sure you can notice that's one thing. Um, but please, you know, be here and be engaged is what we have. And be polite. And this is a really wonderful opportunity for you. We're going to have all these speakers from all over the place. Even if it's not your topic, uh, your main interest, it's a great opportunity to learn something more about transportation. So um, we want you to embrace this opportunity. All right. Any questions about technical details? What's that? Yeah. Yeah. Every seminar has three questions. Not the answer. No, no, no. No, not a test. Yeah, it's to get you get you thinking about this, right? And of course, we we would love for you to ask the questions, but you know, I mean, we don't have enough time for all of you to ask all three of your questions. Okay, any other any other questions? 
Okay, and what we're doing today, this is how we start every year, is with a session where we attempt to explain ITS Davis, and we have a little over an hour left. <laughs> uh, we will fail, but by the end, you will have a better idea of what this is all about, even if things are still a little fuzzy, and you will have a very good sense of the of the people here and the broad spectrum of different kinds of research that we're doing and um, specific opportunities for students. So we're going to do a bunch of different speakers, five minutes each, and I get to start. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just going to start ITS Davis. You're here. I think you know. The important thing to know is we are the world's leading university center on sustainable transportation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and partly why we're the world's leading university center on sustainable transportation is because we have this huge array of other centers and programs and initiatives that are either housed within ITS Davis, administered by ITS Davis, or affiliated with ITS Davis. So ITS Davis, kind of, well, it's all of us. And all of this. So, there you go. All right. I'm going to start with the National Center for Sustainable Transportation, uh, of which I am the director, and it is housed here, administered through ITS Davis. This is a, um, well, a little hard to explain. It's part of a federal program called the University of Transportation Centers Program, and it is a, a very nice, large grant from the U.S. Department of Transportation um, that gets matched with some other funding, and it's an amazing resource that I'll explain in a minute um, for all of us. Uh, we have lots of partners in the National Center, including UC Riverside, uh, USC, Cal State Long Beach, Georgia Tech, University of Rhode Island. Um, these partners do a lot of um, similar similar work to what we do, but also complementary work, and there are opportunities for you to connect with researchers at those schools if they're doing something relevant to people. Uh, the National Center funds activities in research. Most of the money does go for research, but it also supports educational activities of various sorts. I think I have another slide on that. And then another big thing we do, which of course is a big thing that ITS Davis in general does, is think about engagement, connecting with the people who are going to be using our research. So, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, right. So, uh, and here we are, right here in Sacramento, right? So, great opportunity to hear from the policymakers. You know, what are their research needs? And then, of course, we're always trying to get our research out there. So the NCSC puts a lot of effort into engagement as well. Um, I should call out Lauren Yakabuchi is our program manager for the NCSC. Very important person for doing everything. And is Mike here? Justin Petos is our engagement guy. So he's the one, you know, making webinars and helping you with policy briefs and all this. Okay. Uh, the research we support is essentially everything we do here at IEGIS Davis, and you can see the structure sort of follows our, our track for CTP. That's not a coincidence, but, you know, we'll fund all kinds of research. Now, what you really want to know about are opportunities for students. So uh, a whole bunch of different things. So all that research money um, that supports a whole bunch of different projects, every project is required to have a, some of the money has to go towards a graduate student researcher. A lot of you are working on projects that are funded by the National Center for Education. Uh, there's money for dissertation fellowships. Once you pass your qualifying exam, you are eligible to these fellowships. those every year. Uh, November 1st and April 1st in mind. Um, like I said, there's some possibility of, of connecting with researchers at those partner schools. 
Uh, of course, everything was different last year, but in years before that, we had um, exchanges. So, you know, faculty members across the schools were working together. Then we sent a student to that school, and one of their students came here and spent some time together working on research. So we'll probably have some of those in the future. Uh, some of the money sometimes goes for extra courses or ad hoc courses. So if there's a topic you all are really interested in, we have enough student demand, there's somebody who can teach the course, we might be able to offer kind of a special course. I'm hearing lots of things about transit. <laughs> uh, Susie's going to talk more about transit. Um, the, some of the funding goes to bring in IDS seminar speakers, especially now that we're traveling again. Um, and then, um, like I said, engagement is a big part of what we do, and that creates really interesting opportunities for students. Um, sometimes students are presenting their research uh, in, in the webinars we give for policymakers and public agencies. You know, sometimes we have meetings here that students have an opportunity to participate in. So be on the lookout for those kind of opportunities and take advantage of them. It's one of the things that makes um, being a graduate student in transportation here at Davis very special. And I'm sure there are many other things I'm forgetting. So that's the National Center. I should note that today is a very interesting day for the National Center because Congress, maybe you've been hearing about this infrastructure bill. Okay. Yeah, our money, well, the, the yeah, the transportation money expired last night and we're waiting for Congress to do something. When they finally pass, <laughs> not the big infrastructure bill, but the smaller infrastructure bill, then that will kick off a whole new competition for these university transportation centers. So it's likely we'll be working on a proposal on that this coming year, and which means that next year I might be up here saying something very different than what I've been saying today. <laughs> Fingers crossed. And then uh, just to confuse things, I also want to note there's a, this thing called the Pacific Southwest Region UTC which is also a part of this federal UTC program. And we are a member of this. This is the center for the California-ish region. And this one is led by USC. So, so we partner with them on both of these centers. Uh, but this also includes a bunch of the other UC campuses as well. And so some, there is some research money that comes through the PSR and a few activities associated with it. So you probably don't have to worry about that, but just now you know if somebody says PSR, it's one of these UTC things. Questions? All right. Oh, quick. Um, who are the partners for the NCSC? Uh, USC, Cal State Long Beach, UC Riverside, Georgia Tech, Vermont. Yeah. All right. So now we go down the list. Everybody gets five minutes. Anne Marie's okay. keeping track. If I raise my hand, that means you've got 10 seconds left. <laughs> yeah. Anne Marie sent out the email with the list, and it has contact names and emails. So we're going to go fast. If there aren't times for questions, if there isn't time for questions and you want to follow up, feel free to email the person on the list. All right. Dylan. Oh, are you in this? Are you just talking? We're just talking. Yep. Perfect. Maybe I'll <laughs> I don't know. Go back to the list. Yeah. Yeah. Go back to the yeah. list. Okay. Uh, wait. Yeah, the list. There was a list at some point. Do we have it? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Oh, right there. yeah. Here. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Dylan Fitch. I'm research faculty here at ITS. And just seven years ago, I was a CDC student. Um, and as a postdoc, I started uh, a new initiative called the Bison Plus Research Collaborative, which was really just an extension of what Susan and many other researchers at UC Davis have done here um, for the past 30 years, uh, being leaders in bicycling behavior and other aspects of bicycling. Um, we didn't have a formal kind of center for showcasing existing research, current research, um, and kind of reaching out uh, across the campus. So that's what I did in 2019. And so it's, it doesn't have a, it just has one unifying theme and that is that it's gotta be bike 
scooter, small vehicle, any any kind of vehicle that can fit in the bike lane, then you're in our theme and um, we want to connect with you. So um, there are researchers uh, that are studying travel behavior like Susan and I, um, urban planning, but we also have researchers that are doing like, mechanical stuff with small vehicles, biomechanics, um, urban design. I mean, there's just this broad array of topics related to um, bicycling. So if you're interested, come talk to me and I'll try to find uh, the right person to connect you with. Um, that's a lot less than five minutes. Yeah. But I, <laughs> so if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. All right. Great. Thank you. Lou. Bernadette's going to go next. Oh, okay. oh, we can hear from Lou. Oh, we can hear from Lou. Okay. Sure. Some people have to leave a little early. Well, well I'm sorry, the slides in an order, or is it just? Yeah, it's fine. Right there. Okay, who where who's in front of that? CRC. Thank you. All right, here we go, people. Lou, you've been spending too much time in Canada. I know. I'm just too polite. <laughs> uh, so my name is Bernadette Austin. I'll work on projecting so you all can hear me in the back. Um, I'm with the Center for Regional Change, and I am the least transporty person here. But hopefully, if you want to work with the people who use transportation, I would be a very good resource for you. So we do work that is community engaged. It's policy oriented. Those are probably two things really important to folks. And at the core of what we do is social equity. So we look at how these systems transcend or work within regions. They transcend jurisdictions. Transportation is a perfect example of that. Um, so this is a little bit about our structure, and I'll just point out one key thing. We have a leadership board comprised of thought leaders from around the state. Is it, is it we that? also work with students. Um, oh, yeah. We also work with, uh, we have student fellows who from January through June of each year um, get a placement, which is usually community engaged research on campus or with a civic or community partner. So those are two things you might um, want to tap into our resources and learn more about. So our regional advisory committee, you can go to our website. Again, well, I'm sure they'll share contact information, but we have folks who may have, um, may lead organizations that are of interest to you if you want to work with an advocacy organization, um, an organization that's working um, on transportation kind of regional issues. We have the um, executive directors of the Sacramento Area Council of Governments and the San Joaquin Council of Governments who are on our regional advisory committee. So these are some interactions that we could help make that might support some of the work you're doing. We also have a Bradshaw Scholars Program. It is for both undergraduate and graduate students. And often it's a one-to-one -one relationship, but sometimes we'll have a small team of two or three students who are working with a particular placement. We are seeking people now, so go to our website and learn more information if you're interested in a placement from January through June. It is a, it, you receive a stipend, but it's not an hourly pay. And this just highlights some of the kinds of research projects we do. We really try and have um, uh, outcomes like reports or research briefs or policy briefs that can inform stakeholders, implementers, policymakers, and I'll just highlight a couple of these. Um, we worked with, we were working on a, a comprehensive project with folk communities in Clear Lake. Um, we've done comprehensive projects um, with both data and with community engagement around housing. And so you can imagine things like the built environment, natural resources, housing, those kinds of like land use related topics. If you're interested in how transportation integrates with some of these other factors, we might also be a good resource for you. And we'll just highlight sort of our philosophy. We believe in taking research into policy, into having an impact, the interest of time. I won't go into those too much. Seems pretty logical. And I'll just highlight um, one of our partnerships is with the Transportation Equity and Environmental Justice Advisory Group, which is a mouthful, so we call it a TJAG. And these uh, individuals have helped advise one particular research project, and they've continued to be in an advisory role. We did another project in carbon neutrality, and they provided some really good insight. We're working on another project being led by Susan Handy, who you just saw. And for example, looking at, uh, in this particular project, we're looking at transportation post-COVID, whatever post-COVID looks like, and getting input. So for example, one of the TJAG members who's already committed to helping advise that project, she works for Resources for Independent Living, 
and she's providing insight into how people who are living with mobility or sensory issues can make sure that they're weighing in on this research that's informing policymakers. So if you want to take a minute, you can snap a picture of my contact information, and I'm so happy that you're all here in person. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Thank you. You do have a little bit more. Do you want any, anyone have questions? For Bernadette? They're all they're not Okay, Lou. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, wait. There was, they don't want to ask it anymore. Oh. Oh. Yeah, you do it. <laughs> okay. So, um, you're good. Uh, Susan showed a slide that shows like, I don't know, 15 different groups with an ITS. And some of them are in a subgroup called STEPS or STEPS Plus. We always have to say plus now because it's even better than it was. And, you know, <laughs> and it'll be like STEPS Max and stuff like that. Um, and STEPS is five of these groups, a fairly large research oriented groups, all of them have some research components, but that are bound together both topically and because we haven't common funding system and we have a consortium with a number of stakeholders, companies, government agencies that creates a nice holistic uh, system for these groups. And um, th those are the kinds of organizations involved. Next slide, I want to do that, yeah. It should be working. It should be better. Oh, no, there we go. Um, this is probably old, actually, but it gives you some idea that slightly darker ones are, are the steps ones. And let's just keep going. Um, here they are. So there's um, five of them, and we're going to hear about each one. So I won't spend, I'm not going to spend much time on this whole concept. The centers are the key thing. Okay, there's the Three Revolutions Future Mobility Center. Giovanni's here. Energy Futures is the center that I run. Sustainable Freight is run by uh, Marsha Miller, who's here. Plug-in hybrid electric vehicles is run by Gil Paul and uh, is Gil behind you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and China Center for Energy and Transportation is run by Yu Chi Wang. And also, incidentally, Energy Futures. Uh, Alan Jen is going to present on that today. He's our assistant uh, director of Energy Futures. And so they all work on these different aspects of transportation that you can see. We work together a lot on various research projects, but we have our own slightly different scopes that, that we get into. Um, and we have a lot of projects that involve students, uh, both in terms of the, we have a lot of gift funding from, from companies and from other sponsors, and then we have actually a lot of contracts that are in play at any given time. So there's a lot going on in any of these uh, centers or programs at any given moment. Um, that's just that's actually an ITS slide. The same idea. Here are the sponsors. Uh, you can, you know, get a sense of, of who is involved. Most of the major OEMs are involved in funding us. Uh, we have quite a few energy companies, and some of them are fossil fuel companies. But we have a lot of influence with these fossil fuel companies, which is kind of interesting. Uh, we have electric utilities. We have the major government agencies like the ARB. CEC, we have the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency involved, and so it's a great mix. And we do two seminar uh, symposia a year that haven't been in person in a while, and we're not sure what's going to happen in December, but we're hoping maybe December will be back to being in person. It would be uh, a two-day or one-and-a-half-day event. I think it's uh, December 9th and 10th. I don't know if anybody remembers, but I don't remember offhand, but it's around that time may end up being online, we'll see. But that's usually a really interesting event. And I think that's all I wanted to say about steps. Now, I happen to have UNC slides, so yeah, I just keep going. Okay. So I'm going to present one of the five centers uh, on behalf of Dixie Wang, who leads it, and it's our China Center. And so this one's a little different from some of the other ones, which are more topical. This is a, obviously a regional one. And um, he's been running this center for probably 12 years or something like that. And it's been yun -Chi's baby, he's developed it into a very important center, both from a research point of view, but also in terms of linking things happening in California and uh, policymakers in California to things happening in China and policymakers in China. And it's the now actually called the U.S. 
the China US UK Zev policy lab, UK just got on there. I, I haven't even had a chance to talk to him about it. I know he's close to getting the Netherlands to sign on as well, and they've been talking to Canada. So it's it's all about Zev policy and how are we going to basically get Zevs into the market in these countries in an efficient way, in a fast way, because we we're under incredible timeline constraints now. We have to make so much happen in the next 10 to 30 years. So he's focusing on that in those countries. Um, some of the things they've done, uh, they, they had a big um, <laughs> event at a Silomar. So Silomar is a conference that happens every two years that uh, ITS Davis uh, leads and sponsors. And in 2015, that was the, the place where Volkswagen uh, met with government administrators and admitted that they had been fraudulent with their uh, diesel vehicles. So that, that's one of our big, big wins right there, I guess. Um, and uh, and they, they also have been very involved in various platforms for promoting ZEV and trying to develop ZEV policy for China and the uh, what they call NEVs, their new energy vehicles, um, and, and what kinds of policies and targets uh, China was going to adopt. And I think that's probably, oh, that was, that was the punchline right there. They were next door uh -huh. contesting. Um, so, yeah, and then there's just these, a couple of slides where, like, yeah, we had Jerry Brown, we had Mary Nichols. Mary Nichols recently retired from being the director of our California Air Resource Board. She's been amazing over the last 10 years in terms of leading, and uh, she's worked with her and Jerry Brown and the Chinese. And uh, this is a... a project that's going on right now that actually I'm working on with him and some students to create scenarios for deep decarbonization of vehicles in China. I don't want to attempt to explain that, but you get an idea from these that there are uh, fuel side changes and low carbon uh, scenarios. And so that's an ongoing research project that we're trying to create some innovative new ways that we think China can uh, adopt those and reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. So that project's ongoing and it's just Example there, many things, but I think that's it for Yes. Good. All right. Thank you. Any questions for Lou or the China Center? Okay, next up we have the PATV Center. Oh, I'm next now. <laughs> hey. It's amazing. I don't think I've seen so many people here in 2019 before COVID, so it's, it's great to see you all. Um, I think it's my slide will say uh, Dahlia Garrett. I'm not Dahlia Garrett, I'm Gil. Uh, but usually I like Dahlia to, usually I, li I like Dahlia to present in this seminar because she is the most important person in the Plug and Hydro Electric Vehicle Research Center, and she helps the students in many, many different ways, so it's really good that you will know her. So she had to run with her uh, to pick up her kids, which is more important. Uh, but uh, it will be if you guys will just visit us and say hi and introduce yourself. Uh, that that will be great. Yeah, it is. So let's move to the next one. And where are you? Oh, and we are just across the street here in this building. And let's say if you're affiliated with us right now, just raise your hand for a second so people can meet you around. Uh, it's this corner here. <laughs> <laughs> and you can kind of chat with, with uh, the group that's called there. So this is a mouthful, Plug-in Hybrid and Electric Vehicle Research Center, and that's kind of how we were not ready for the future. Back 13 years ago, 14 years ago, the California Energy Commission wanted to start a new center on plug-in hybrid vehicles because no one was believing back then that full electric will make a comeback. By the time they started the center a year later, Tesla was starting, Nissan was talking about their first cars, and they had to change their name. And instead of just dropping the second part, they had the end. So now we are plug-in plug hybrid and electric vehicle research center. But if you were to just say electric vehicle research center, that, that's good enough. Uh, we don't need to. We, we carry it because it's already in the papers. We are here as your few all the other <laughs> slides. And... Uh, what do we say about this uh, group? We have a, a large group of full-time researchers, what we call here at UC Davis professional researcher or UC system, uh, 
that we are also advisors for some of you, the graduate students in other universities, they call it research professors or similar, uh, similar names. Some of us here, uh, Ken Caroli is doing it for more than 30 years. Some are doing it for a little bit less. And each one is focused on a little bit different topics and different research methods. We, we study people, even though we are the electric vehicle research center, what we study is not vehicles, we study the people who buy these cars, who drive the cars, who charge the cars. This is what we study, we study people. A unit of analysis, you go to a research methods class is individual. Sometimes we go up all the way to households, but we are not designing cars. That's not what, uh, what we are doing. Um, and our work is usually in groups. Very, very few projects are kind of one on one, it's usually in groups. And they usually combine interviews, focus groups, a lot of surveys, a lot of data collection from the vehicles second by second data collection from the vehicles. And the methods we are using are statistical methods, machine learning, interviews, as I said, and so on, and trying to combine them together. I will confess it's not easy. Right now I'm reading the TRB papers uh, reviews, and some of them said, drop the interview part, the paper is great without it, and others said, drop the statistical part, the interviews are enough. Mm. Very few like them together in the same paper. But I think it makes our work much more interesting and strong. The other thing that makes our work, I think, very interesting and strong is that we do only applied science. We always have to have external validity. It's really nice to know that what you're doing is right and the method is strong, but if you are, cannot take it to the real world outside, it's not relevant for us. And all of those are our sponsors, but more than the sponsors, these are the guys who keep us honest. Because they are the clients or the people we show them the results. And if we are doing something that makes no sense, usually they will tell us immediately. For you guys to work with us, it's a great opportunity to meet a lot of uh, government agencies, car companies, foundations, uh, and so on. And that's the way to, I think, the, the best way to, or the best reason to be part of ITS and part of TTP is that you have this exposure on top of, of the education you get here. Some recent studies. I would be surprised with you on each one of these slides, Dalia, because <laughs> 30 seconds. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. We collect tons of data on many different reasons and many different things as I already said. We publish both like fun academic papers, that's a nature energy paper that Scott Harman and I just published this year, on people who buy this Tesla autopilot Oh no, this is about discontinuous, the other one should be good. Discontinuous, about people who used to have electric car and don't have one now. Why, what should we do about it? And the other one <laughs> <laughs> is about gender bias in buying and using electric cars. And we have many more really cool papers. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, good afternoon everybody. So nice to be back in person here with all of you. I'm Giovanni Circella. Many of you already know me. I direct the Three Revolutions of Future Mobility program here at UC Davis. And we are based in the buildings next door in the 1715 Celia Street. So many of you actually already work with us and do projects or research and a lot of activities. Yes, the slide. Thank you. Perfect. So many of you might be wondering what are the three revolutions. Those of you that have been around already for a while know very well. Uh, oops, better. <laughs> <laughs> many of you already know what the three revolutions are. I would uh, really recommend, if you haven't read it yet, uh, our great leader, ITS director Dan Sperling, wrote this great book with a contribution from many other authors. Uh, some of them actually probably in this room. Yeah, you know, I, I'm not recommending to buy it, I'm just saying. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, uh, the vision that really is in the book really shows how the new technologies that are revolutionizing transportation, share mobility, electrification, automation, they can really lead us to a better world with better opportunities, more mobility, a cleaner environment, but it calls the goal wrong. We could have more pollution, more car dependence, a lot of problems. 
And it's very important to do research here at UC Davis, and we're proud of that, that it's relevant for policy to really inform how we can steer the future in a better way. So, just diving in a little bit. The field has changed a lot in the last few years. Car sharing has been around for a lot of years, bike sharing, other services. Today, really what uh, is important is uh, our smartphones. <laughs> and we can access a lot of services now. We're moving into the mobility as a service, uh, super apps, a lot of opportunities. And we're really interested in studying these. These are the new toys that are in our cities, but also with the thoughts in the future, like, you know, automation in the future will change also transportation a lot. So the main key question that we have in our center, in our program, is really to wonder how are these transportation revolutions affecting vehicle ownership and travel behavior, and how can we inform the policy also to steer towards a better future? We run a lot of research activities. First of all, the first bullet is probably the most important one that a lot of you have been involved. We collect a lot of data and we analyze them. And these are data on the adoption, behavioral aspect, uh, and attitudinal uh, aspects related to the adoption of new technologies and how they relate with the travel choices, vehicle ownership, uh, and uh, all related aspects of that. But also we run a lot of forecasting and simulation models, other colleagues working with us, uh, Carolina Rodier, uh, Miguel Hayer, and others, they do a lot of models uh, to really forecast the travel demand in the future, greenhouse gas emission, vehicle might travel to understand different scenarios. We do some behavioral experiments. I personally have been running one with uh, our colleague John Walker at Berkeley to really simulate how the future could look like with autonomous vehicles. And uh, sometimes we need to do that because sometimes we don't have that technology ready yet to really run an experiment or really try the technology. So we do some attempts to do some experiments to see how things could look like. A lot of our work is really policy analysis. Uh, I would say Molly D'Agostino here next to us. Uh, she's our uh, lead for our policy side of our program. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of the work we do is really policy relevant. We're glad that we have our policy people that really connect the research to policy. We do a lot of scenario analysis for future transportation scenarios. And really a lot of what we do is analyzing the environmental, economic, and equity impacts that can be associated with the new technologies and changing child behavior. We have a lot of data. I want to point that the data are not only from the U.S., but we are becoming considerably international. So we've been collecting data over the course of the years. A lot of the work we're doing now is also to study how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted transportation. We've done it in a lot of different cities in the U.S. and Canada. We're doing it increasingly more with our partners in Latin America, in Asian cities, in Europe. We're also working with a sustainable city in Dubai. Uh, seeing how really new uh, technologies can be implemented in a more sustainable way. We have a lot of data. Our students around the room and colleagues, uh, raise your hand if you're working with us in the Three Revolution Future Mobility Program. We have many of you that are involved in projects and activities with our program. We really have a lot of different data sets. If you're interested in the narrative, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. I'm almost done. <laughs> and we can really, like, you know, if you're interested in doing some of these activities, uh, you can join us and you can. Interact with us. These are wonderful colleagues, faculty members, students, postdocs. Really, really nice team working together in a very cooperative way. Uh, many of you actually in the room actually cooperate with Susie Pike, Khalil Fulton, Dylan, Alan Jen. A lot of work done really in collaboration with a lot of great leaders. Our sponsors, and I will leave you with our website where you can find more information on the three revolution in general and our COVID research. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we can yeah. do that. Can we do that? Yeah, we, we can. can do that. We can do that. Absolutely, we can. Hold on. Other side. Oh, it's fine. Yeah, there's plenty. There we go. Oh, Take questions while we're waiting. That's a lot of info. Where's the drive? Uh,
it didn't get the left. Let's just reopen the computer all over. I heard it. Yeah. I heard it. Hey there. No. <laughs> Uh, light is on. Yeah. It's on. Yeah. It's like red. Yeah. It's it's uh it's expat, so it should work on both. Yeah. Okay. I don't see it. Uh, all right. That's all right. I don't
We don't want to have to go so fast because it's hard. But the slower we go, the more pressure we put on our liquid fuel systems to decarbonize, and that's also very hard. So, yeah. So this, you know, gives some perspective of like the types of, you know, outputs that we're 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 looking at and what kind of results you can see. Um, from our spatial modeling, this is just an example of like, oh, how might you distribute uh, fueling stations to meet hydrogen demand as it, you know, integrates into you know, heavy duty vehicles or light duty vehicles. Um, so this was actually a, a fairly large uh, modeling effort that, that we've gone through, uh, yeah, well, over a year of modeling and, and quite a large um, group of researchers helping with this. So yeah, I'll end there, hopefully on time, and if there's any, any uh, um, questions or interest, definitely, you know, feel free to, to hit me up or any of the folks associated with the, the program. So I'm Marshall Miller. I'm the director of the Sustainable Freight Research Program. This is the last of the five uh, that will be talked about in, uh, in Step 4A. Uh, uh, we're, a, a yeah. we're a fairly new program, only been around a couple of years. Much of our work overlaps with energy futures. I'll show some of our projects that we work on. You'll see a number of them are the same things that Alan was just talking about. We focus uh, not on all vehicles. We focus on trucks. We also look at buses, uh, so the heavier on-road vehicles. We have two tracks in our program. One is logistics, basically how do you get items from one location to another. Uh, item may come into a, a seaport, go to a distribution center, uh, be trucked to an online a warehouse or a retail store, and finally get to your house. Uh, the other track is technologies and fuels. So we look at advanced technologies, fuel cells, battery vehicles, battery electric vehicles, and new fuels, electricity, hydrogen, and biofuels, and try and understand in trucks and buses, how do those help us get to lower carbon emissions and lower criteria pollutants and so on. Um, some of the questions we, we ask are, how do these new technologies uh, and fuels, how, how can they be adapted to be more suitable uh, in logistics operations, where you have, for example, delivery trucks coming from, again, the port, uh, online uh, warehouses, and so on, to a house. Uh, when will battery electric or fuel cell trucks become economically competitive with diesel trucks? Uh, and that involves what we call the total cost of ownership. Uh, capital cost, fuel cost, maintenance cost. Um, and what we find is, for example, near term, a lot of battery electric fuel cell trucks are not competitive, but in five to 10 year time frames, you start to see them either becoming more competitive or actually better than the, the uh, diesel truck. And in general, uh, what is the best plan to introduce these new technologies and fuels to reduce trucking emissions while keeping costs manageable? So a couple of example projects, the spatial modeling project, uh, Alan briefly talked about, we look at trucking spatially across California, try and understand what the fuel demand will be over time, where infrastructure needs to be placed. Uh, battery electric vehicles, trucks have limited range. So when they do deliveries, this would be a logistics issue, do you need to change how they do their routes? Their routes have to be shorter. So maybe you need to move a distribution center closer to the end, end of that route so that they don't have to drive quite as far. Um, we have done an analysis of maintenance costs for trucks. Maintenance cost is very important. I mentioned total cost of ownership, capital cost, fuel cost, and maintenance cost. In some cases, without that maintenance cost savings, you don't see an economically feasible vehicle. Uh, I think Alan talked about the truck modeling with scenarios. Uh, we have a project where we look at hydrogen freight vehicles and refueling analysis, how many stations do you need, where they need to be, what are the costs going to be over time. And there's a project that looks at the impacts of COVID on e-commerce. That's, again, 
logistics of moving freight, uh, freight around. So I'm going to show a couple of examples of results. Uh, this comes from our modeling out to 2050, actually out to 2045. Uh, this is for trucks in a U.S. model where we have two scenarios. One is a what we call low carbon, uh, very fast penetration of uh, advanced technology, battery electric and fuel cell vehicles, and a BAU, which is sort of a very low uh, penetration of advanced technologies, kind of what we're seeing now. The blue curve is the difference in vehicle cost between the two scenarios. The red curve is the difference in fuel and maintenance. And the yellow curve is the total. So you see the yellow curve starts becoming more expensive. The advanced scenario, low carbon scenario, is more expensive than BAU. Turns around, crosses zero around 2033 or so, and then you start to see enormous savings. Okay, I'll just do this last one. So this is a logistics study. Basically looks at the energy uh, per item to be delivered and the, the uh, greenhouse gases per item to be delivered. There are four bars: retailer, online retailer, Amazon, and Amazon High Rush. And you can see that retailers, e-retailers, are roughly the same energy and CO2. Amazon has managed to get low, lower emissions, lower energy. But if you have a high rush scenario, you the uh, explodes. You see the energy and the CO2 get very, very large. So I'll stop there. Same Pavement Center? Yep. Good. <laughs> Which one's the patient center? <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, eight, eight. All right. So not this one. This one, right? Yeah. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Wang Dong Wu. I'm uh, not a director. I'm just a real project scientist uh, working <laughs> at the uh, Primary Research Center. Uh, my boss is uh, he has to choose the day to not be here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have a, a, a camp, we have a facility at both Davis and uh, Berkeley. And then the, if you does it work? Okay. So if you happen to get fed up with all these like, vehicle stuff, it's only 10 minutes, we're only still five minutes away. You can probably walk there. Bike will be welcome too. Um, so that's uh, just down the road, that way. And then uh, you can find out what we're looking. This is like a six, maybe six, seven years ago now. You can find out what it looks like now. Um, and then so we have uh, Professor Harvey as our uh, director. We have a co-director, Dr. David Jones. Um, I, uh, we are welcoming another professor, but uh, I don't know who she is or who she is. Um, and then we have a 19 staff here at Davis and seven at Berkeley. Um, we have a lot of graduate students, postdocs, and many undergraduate students. Um, they help us do the, a lot of work. We, we don't do anything. We just sit in our office. They actually <laughs> do the work. <laughs> And we also have a business scholar. Um, so <laughs> instead of telling you what we're doing, I'm going to have you guess what we're doing. Um, so this is uh, somebody, <laughs> my colleague, is mixing stuff. Uh, so we are making stuff, uh, cook, basically cooking stuff uh, with the uh, rocks, uh, buying uh, asphalt. Um, I cakes over here, but maybe that's just because I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's very delicious, trust me. <laughs> um, so basically, we uh, we deal with the payments, anything that relates to payments. So this is just uh, we are handling the materials, trying to see how to perform. We um, uh, work. It should. Okay, okay, okay it works. Right. It works. Right. So then, then we make specimens, and we break. Uh, we see, uh, how, uh, how, and then we break them. We try to break them. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to break this one. <laughs> it's, it's okay. All there right. <laughs> okay. So we also make a bigger, bigger uh, specimen. 
in this case, is that we, we make roads. So we build our test roads, and we use our big machine to, to crush them. To fail. So now we know how they perform. Um, of course, we have all, all the models that, that goes along with those analysis. And this is one of the equipment that we do. We, we find out how, noise, how noisy um, the roads are when you drive on them. Um, this is the one that we tell us how, how, uh, how structurally sound they are when you drive on them. Um, so if you want to know more, um, there's a link. I'm pretty sure you guys can Google it out. Um, and uh, we do have uh, our budget, uh, annual budget, uh, in the several millions. So we do have a lot of money. And we also have uh, not only uh, the uh, making stuff, breaking stuff, we also do modeling. Um, so we have a lot of data to work with because we help auctions manage the uh, uh, payment network. So there's a huge amount of data. We sure can use some brain power to do the, the analysis. We are interested in people. If you are interested in machine learning, uh, we have a lot of data to, to work with. Um, uh, and we also, uh, I think, uh, if you guys want to make some money, uh, we will be waiting for you. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> And I am um, going to talk about the Transit Research Center, which I think is the newest of the research centers here um, at ITS. Um, just kind of formed in the past year as more and more of my own research started to revolve around public transportation. And then I also started to notice that I wasn't alone here doing public transportation research. There are um, a number of other researchers who are working on various aspects of things related to public transportation. So as I kind of looked at that, I identified three primary categories that we cover, I think, here, although there are certainly many more aspects to public transportation research. But my work has um, stemmed a lot from this innovations in public transportation. So looking at things like how um, transit agencies are partnering with Uber or Lyft or um, another innovation we can think about is electric buses. We do a lot of alternative fuel research there, as you guys can see. Um, and then in addition to kind of this innovations world and how transit agencies make decisions to adopt or implement different innovations, we have researchers working on um, planning and policy related to public transportation. So things like um, whether communities are introducing transit-oriented development and how that process happens, whether cities are coordinating planning with transit agencies, and whether that planning is also coordinated with land use decisions. So those kinds of questions. And then, of course, travel behavior, right? So what factors contribute to people deciding to use public transit or not? Um, okay. So. I'm not doing all of that research. <laughs> there are a number of other folks here who are um, kind of affiliated with the Transit Research Center as we're growing. So I've been working a lot with Molly D'Agostino. Um, Dan Sperling has increasingly been interested in working on public transit. Um, Jesus Corajas is a new, fairly new professor in environmental science and policy. He works a lot on um, equity and decision making in public transit. Um, and then a postdoc who works with Susan Handy, Alisa Barber, does more of the kind of planning and transit-oriented development kinds of projects. Um, and then Beth Ferguson is a um, assistant professor in design. So she has done some studies looking at designing different elements and wayfinding in public transportation. So it's kind of a little bit different than what we do, but also super important for public transit. So spanning lots of different areas. And then, of course, Dylan looking at some of these extensions to the micro mobility, and then of course, folks like Giovanni and Susan doing lots of travel behavior work. But um, if it's not focusing on transit, it at least covers transit and decisions to use transit to some extent. Um, so, those are more, most of the things <laughs> that I wanted to say, but 
Also, since we're new, we certainly have a lot of room to grow as a transit research center. I know many of you incoming students are really interested in public transportation, so you have an opportunity to kind of shape a little bit the directions of this center as we grow. And um, one of the opportunities to do that is um, to participate and maybe present at a transit research symposium that we're planning for May of this coming year. So, um, you know, let's be on the lookout for more information related to that event as we start um, putting more of the details together. And then the last thing I'll say, <laughs> as we have room to grow, you notice that some of the more established programs, um, like the NTSC or like the STEPS programs, have lots of different sponsors. So as a new center that's just growing, I uh, took advantage of this um, UC Davis crowdfunding uh, platform, which allows projects and centers and athletic teams from all over campus to participate in a university-organized crowdfunding um, campaign which launched today. Um, I'll also point out that the Center for Regional Change is on that list as well of centers and projects that are raising money in this way. So, so be on the lookout for maybe an email from me, not to donate, but to share and to kind of um, spread the word about the work that we're doing um, with folks in your own network. All right, thank you. Manager for the Policy Institute for Energy, Environment, and the Economy. Um, and this is Molly D'Agostino. She's been introduced a couple times. She kind of uh, sits on in a couple different areas or realms, but she works really closely with the Policy Institute um, as part of the Three Revolutions Future Mobility Program. Um, so, just a little bit about us we leverage university expertise and engage directly with decision makers um, to, deliver, to deliver credible, relevant, and timely information to inform better energy and environmental policy outcomes. Um, so really, in summary, I would say that it's our job to connect those who have questions to those who have answers. And UCD, this is a place where you get, um, you get your answers uh, met, um, or questions answered. answered I should. Um, we work with a lot of great folks on our team. Austin Brown is our executive director. He's on leave um, in Washington, D.C. right now. He's working with uh, the Biden administration. Um, so in the interim, we are lucky to have Dan Sperling as our interim ED. Um, he's also the, the founder of the Policy Institute. We were started back in 2011. Um, so he's, he's a great resource for us. Um, we have seven people on staff, um, several policy analysts, um, a policy director, um, myself as well, focused on um, outreach. And uh, we also work with several um, associate re re affiliate researchers, and we have um, several GSRs on staff and student interns as well. Um, so we really try to engage with, with students, um, you know, whether you're an undergrad or in, in grad school. Um, we try to make sure that there are lots of opportunities to engage if you're interested in that, in that nexus between uh, policy and research. That's in that you're interested in. Yeah, sorry, I didn't, I didn't have that. That's sort of what happened. Yeah. <laughs> um, so some of our key activities include identifying existing and new research for immediate policy needs, amplifying UC expertise, efforts, and resources, developing ongoing relationships, um, and then facilitating engagement between policymakers and the research community. Um, so we really try to be sort of a bridge and connection point um, between what's happening here and what's happening at the Capitol um, here in California or in Washington, D.C., or even, even locally, depending on what policymakers need. And here's another chart. We've seen a lot of these, but I don't even know how helpful it is. <laughs> but, um, it's just meant to show, you know, that, that we're all kind of working together. And a lot of these institutes, um, sorry, that's supposed to say energy efficiency. Um, but a lot of these centers are doing their own policy work too. So we really, we really try to figure out ways to 
support efforts that are already ongoing and to fill any gaps um, that might be present. So there's a lot of um, collaboration happening and a lot of coordination between these different centers to figure out like, you know, who's doing what, how can we help, where do we have, you know, areas of expertise or capacity that can um, help amplify that research and make those connections. Um, and this is just a graphic I think that's meant to convey that um, we play a really big translational role. So, um, you know, if research is coming out of UC Davis, it's not always, it often is not necessarily geared towards policymakers. So um, the translational piece is just making sure that the, the findings and the conclusions are, um, you know, able to be understood by people who are uh, developing and implementing policy. Um, so, you know, we work closely with researchers to help with that translational piece and also not, not to oversimplify because um, that, that part is really important as well. And we have several areas of focus. Um, these are all areas where UC Davis has um, sort of a specialized niche. Um, and so these were um, these areas of focus, energy systems, sustainable transportation, water and ecosystems, environmental justice, future cities, and climate neutrality. Um, these were the areas that were identified earlier on when we were first um, launched um, as a place where we could help really um, identify policy gaps or research gaps, um, help build connections, um, and sort of play a, an integral role in that way. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to say that one of the, one of the things that we do is post um, a monthly seminar series. It's really informal. It's called Policy and Popcorn. Um, I started a, a year ago, like right, right when things shut down, or a year and a half ago. Um, but prior to the shutdown, uh, these these uh, policy and popcorn seminars used to happen in this room, so there was actual popcorn. So I, I have yet to go to a policy and popcorn that popcorn is like in the room, but I'm looking forward to that. I think it should be you know starting up soon. I hope. Um, so the next one that's happening is on Tuesday, October 12th. It's from 2 to 3.30, um, and it's focused on how to get involved in policy. So this is a really good introduction um, if you're you know, interested in this idea, want to want to find out more. Um, three of our uh, staff will be presenting, and um, uh, we work to have one of these seminars uh, take place once a month. So um, just be on the list. Anything you want to add? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have popcorn machine. There's actually <laughs> um, a full on popcorn machine, like one of those old fashioned like popcorn machines, like that you see as like a fair. It's here. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 First up is the uh, Davis Student Energy Game. Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah. cool. So I realize it's my first time presenting in person to a room of full people from like a year ago. So I'm nervous, but also excited. But this is good practice because I'm doing my qualifying exam this quarter. So thank you all. <laughs> uh, my name is Jean, and I represent the student organization called Student Energy at UC Davis. So we. Uh, Oh, it's the, the click is behind you, and it's the button to the right. Um, and then who we are is, uh, we are a student organization that's founded in um, 2019. So our main goal is to build a community of leaders in the energy space, um, to share cross-disciplinary knowledge, and to um, take action to accelerate the decarbonization uh, of our energy system. So. Uh, most of you here are in the transportation field, but as you all know, it's very linked to energy systems. So uh, what our club is trying to do is to bridge different field, uh, students from different fields together and to have like a peer-to-peer -peer, um, space to share knowledge and experience with each other. So we are actually a chapter of a global charity, which is called Student Energy, and their mission is to build the next generation of energy leaders um, who will accelerate the world's transition to a sustainable energy future. So a little bit about this global charity, which I think is actually one thing that's really unique about our student organization is that the global um, organization actually has like um, a lot of chapters all over the world. Um, they have engaged over 50,000 students. Um, they were first founded in Canada, but now they've expanded to like over 100 plus countries. 
So in our like monthly check-in with our um, global charity and our parent organization, we actually also get to hear from like what other students are doing around uh, the, the globe and what they're doing at a local scale on their campus. So that's been really engaging and something that's unique, I think, about this organization and why we're really interested in like uh, introducing this to you. Oh, and then they also host an annual energy summit, um, and that is an opportunity to bring like everyone together from the student energy organization. So in terms of our chapter, what we've been doing for the past two years, especially before the pandemic hits, is that we've held like bi-weekly in-person discussions um, just to engage students, meet each other, and like talk about different topics. We cover topics like the electric grid, um, decarbonizing transportation, so anything from uh, say, uh, topics that are in the news uh, to more like nerdy subjects. So uh, <laughs> definitely are all topics are welcome as long as they're related to energy systems. So we have approximately 80 students in, uh, in our listserv and 20 active members who show up to our meetings from time to time. And right now I'm actually recruiting for my executive team. So um, once the pandemic hit, we actually transitioned a lot of our engagement to online forums. So we've hosted these uh, bi-weekly seminars with experts from the industry and academia, and a few folks who are engaged with the Institute and uh, people who you may have heard from today actually participated in some of our seminars. Uh, so we cover a lot of topics such as energy policy, climate and energy politics, um, et cetera. So once again, as you can see, like it's a broad range of topics. Sometimes it's just a really safe space for you to come, even if you just have a little bit of knowledge on it that you want to learn more about it with your peers. Uh, and then lastly, I will mention this project that we did while we were all remote last year. So we participated in creating an educational video to communicate the impact of natural gas and climate change. So these spaces are um, members of Student Energy, and this is just a really cool opportunity for us to stay engaged with the discussion on climate change while being remote. So you know, we have been quite creative in uh, trying to engage with our community, and you know, it's definitely not the same as like, engaging in person. So this year, we're definitely hoping to uh, continue building out our online platform and you know, leverage that resource, but at the same time, get back into the same room. Like what Sarah mentioned about the popcorn, you know, that's just something that's really exciting too. Uh, so, yeah, if you are interested in our organization or want to check us out more, here's my email, and then these are the websites that you can uh, look uh, three more into. Yeah, thank you. Is there another slide? Nope. We can shut that down. Last but not least, and we're right on time, is the uh, WTS student chapter. Hello, everyone. My name is Ray Kosunzade, and I am representing uh, WTS uh, UC Davis, a student chapter uh, today. Uh, we are one of the uh, organizations that are not directly affiliated with ITS, but we are in, um, working with ITS and UC Davis to promote uh, women in transportation. Um, we recently branded as Advancing Women in Transportation, but we are not including uh, only women in our organization. Um, we are, our first and main mission, mission is to promote adverse, adversity in transportation studies. So all and any gender identification are welcome to our uh, group. We have a lot of resources, um, including a scholarship, uh, internships, events, uh, social events, uh, career advancements, and um, academic um, professional development and all of that. With joining us, with joining the UC Davis student chapter, you will get a free membership with UC Davis, uh, with uh, Sacramento chapter, which is actually the fourth one that founded in California, and um, you will be um, getting access to all of five opportunities that uh, WTS is offering. Uh, if you have any questions, you can email me, um, and I hope I see you, many of you, in WTS. Thank you. Well, good job, everyone.
everyone. We're right on time. A couple minutes if anybody has questions. Otherwise, we'll break and see you here next Friday for our the first of our regular external research presenters for our seminar. Yeah, quick question. This is the double check. We're meeting next Friday. What's that? We're meeting next Friday in person. Yes. Yes, they're all in person. They're all in person. Yeah, every week until Thanksgiving, right? And I think we end before Thanksgiving this year. Yeah, the quarter started early this year. All right. All right. Well, great to see you all. Look Thank forward you. to seeing you next week. Thanks, Anne Marie. Thank